Good evening. It's so nice to see you all. Thank you so much for being with us. Welcome to our audience and a very special welcome to Larry Diamond, Minchin Pei, and of course to our moderator, Larry Mantle. To all of our California audience members, we hope you and your families are safe and doing your best to avoid the danger of these very scary storms. America at a Crossroads is a joint venture between Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc. And we thank, as always, our leadership team, especially former Congressman Mel Levine and Zev Yaroslavsky. I suspect that there is not a person in our audience who's not, who is not staying abreast of the political events unfolding in Washington these last couple of weeks. That is why it is especially important that tonight and for the next few weeks, we are focusing on foreign and global affairs, events, and dangers. Next week, we will welcome Ambassador Dennis Ross and Israeli political science Yadidia Stern to provide their expertise and perspective on Netanyahu's return to power and to hear what their informed views are about the new Israeli cabinet. What, is, what does it mean for Israel, for the Middle East, and for the United States? In the email you'll get right after the program tonight, you'll get two links um, on a two-part series from the Washington Institute on the very subject, which is the topic for next week's program. You might want to look at those. They're by David Makovsky. You might want to look at those before the program. Dennis Ross and Yadidia Stern will be in conversation with the always probing Warren Olney. The following week, former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, Michael McFaul, will join us um, to bring us up to date on the Russia-Ukraine war and to share with us his perspective on Putin's near and longer term future. And I know we're gonna hear some about that tonight as well. Remember, if you need it, please turn on your live captioning, your closed captioning and turn your volume up. Uh, finally, as Martin Luther King Day approaches, we join in honoring and commemorating the legacy of Martin Luther King by recognizing the part each of us plays in bringing more justice, democracy, equality, and humanity to our homes, to our communities, and beyond, and to always resist complacency. MLK spoke these words as he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, and I quote, it all boils down to the fact that we must never allow ourselves to become satisfied with unattained goals. We must always maintain a, a, divine, a kind of divine discontent. Now, please welcome my colleague and friend, David Lehrer, for a few Thank more you, Janice, announcements. As we promote divine discontent. Welcome, everyone. It looks like we have another great evening in store for you. Janice mentioned our next two programs dealing with foreign affairs with diplomatic superstars, Ambassadors Dennis Ross and Mike McFall. Following McFall, we'll take another look at foreign policy through the eyes of Robin Wright, a renowned New Yorker columnist who is a foreign policy maven with special expertise in Iran and its mullahs. That will be on February 1st with tonight's host, once again, Larry Mantle. The following week, February 8th, we welcome Congressman Adam Schiff. He'll report on changes in Washington with the new Congress and what he sees in our country's agenda. He'll be in conversation with KCRW's Madeline Brand. And then in mid-February, we host a popular guest who hasn't been with us for a while, the insightful and provocative pundit David Frum. He'll be in conversation with the LA Times' Pat Morrison. It's now my pleasure to introduce Larry Mantle, one of our most frequent hosts in America at Crossroads. If you wonder why Larry is so good at what he does, he spent nearly 40 years, that's tens of thousands of conversations, interviewing nearly everybody who was anybody for his daily news pro program, Air Talk, on the NPR station, KPCC. He will guide us once again through a terrific discussion. Larry? Thank you, David. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for your kind words. And Janice, Mel, Zev, it's always a pleasure to be part of America at a crossroads. And the series of international programs, of course, extremely important. Uh, the implications for U.S. relations around the world are key. But on our daily radio program, I have the opportunity to cover developments in China, Iran, and Russia, and what's happening there that has such a huge impact on our Southern California listeners. It particularly hits home because in LA and Orange counties, uh, we have the largest population of Iranians outside Tehran. And of course, immigrants from China are the bedrock of numerous California communities. This means that what happens during Iranian street protests and crackdowns are very personal. What happens in China is deeply personal to Chinese Americans who live here uh, among us in Southern California and, of course, throughout our country. 
our listeners, family members, and friends, for example, uh, who still live in Iran, are the source of deep concern and sleepless nights. We attempt to speak to that on a regular basis. And I know as we consider the future of the countries that we're going to look at tonight, we keep in mind the tremendous risks that people take for potential freedom. I think we're all moved by the bravery of Iranian protesters, Chinese and Russian dissidents, and Ukrainians who are fighting against Russia's invasion. Our guests tonight return to America to Crossroads to detail what these developments mean for those living under autocratic and theocratic rule, as well as our national interests. Professor Minxin Pei is the Tom and Margot Pritzker Professor of Government at Claremont McKenna College. He's also a fellow and director of the Keck Center for International and Strategic Relations. Uh, Professor Pei is also a non-resident senior fellow with the Asian program of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. He's a frequent commentator on China for many notable programs and publications, including the New York Times, for which he recently wrote an op-ed piece about China's embattled president. Larry Diamond, uh, one of our leading scholars of democracy and responsive government, his many years at Stanford include his current position as senior fellow at the Spoli Institute for International Studies. He's one of the coordinators of the Hoover Institution's Iran Democracy Project and has advised numerous governments over the years. His book, Squandered Victory, the American Occupation, and the bungled effort to bring democracy to Iraq garnered tremendous attention back in 2005. And like Professor Pei, Professor Diamond's analysis are abundant on TV, radio, and in print. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to talk with you this evening. Larry Diamond, let me start with you. As the U.S. has struggled with anti-democratic sectors of our own public, citizens of Iran, Russia, and China have taken tremendous risks to gain freedom from authoritarian rule. Is there any through line to what's happening in those three countries, or is each individually the result of highly specific circumstances there? Well, I think there is a through line. There is some common ground, uh, and it involves um, uh, a, a, a few striking features. Uh, the first is bad performance. Um, now, until recently, I'll let Minchin elaborate on this or, or <laughs> disagree. Until, in, uh, until recently, it looked like China was a juggernaut uh, of effective performance. They were bragging about how superior their system was to the West and uh, promoting their contempt for the way the United States and Europe managed the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, but the lockdown has been really punishing for the Chinese economy and the cavalier disregard that she has, Xi Jinping, President Xi has had, um, I, I, has certainly been a trigger for the recent protests. Uh, I'll let Minchin elaborate. In Iran, you know, you've got just decades of misrule. Uh, of course, the sanctions have badly damaged the economy. But the Ayatollahs uh, have separately and apart from that with their uh, corruption and just incompetence at governing have pretty well um, run the country into the ground on their own in terms of economic development, in terms of environmental destruction, in terms of social equity. Uh, it, it's really a miserable place in which young people feel they don't have opportunity and uh, they don't obviously have freedom. And the same with Russia. Uh, you know, it looked for a while that Putin was a state builder and uh, he was resurrecting Russia. That was Catherine Stoner's term for his book, uh, her book. But um, Russia doesn't look very resurrected now. It looks like um, it's a decrepit uh, personalistic dictatorship in which the unaccountable personalistic dictator has vastly miscalculated in his uh, invasion uh, of Ukraine. And that leads to the other factor. I'll just close with this. In each of these three cases, you have a leader um, who really 
dominates the system uh, and is not very accountable uh, to uh, e even a, a broad uh, section of the broader leadership, not to mention the public at large. Putin, I think, is the most detached from um, any form of accountability. But again, over to you, uh, Min Shen, it sure looks like Xi Jinping has become more and more dominating and unaccountable. And Ayatollah Khamenei is the supreme leader. <laughs> and who can question the supreme leader? And when you are a supreme leader, unaccountable to anyone, if you make mistakes, it's very hard to correct them. And yet we have we have many countries that go along for decades under that kind of incompetent leadership is one of the things, Larry, that's that is particular to these three countries. You have a significant educated populace. So does that put more public demand on an incompetent government than you might find elsewhere where people don't feel that degree of educational empowerment? Yeah, I think education is important. But um, until recently, China had an educated population, but they looked on the surface anyway to be more or less happy with the regime because it was performing. Uh, Singapore is not nearly as authoritarian as any of these countries. They've got one of the highest educated populations in the world. The regime is performing well. It's not that repressive. Uh, there's no regime crisis in Singapore. Uh, so uh, I think um, reasonable levels of education or high levels of education certainly contribute to the possibilities for resistance. Bad government is a very important factor. And um, a third factor is information. You know, one of the reasons why the protests are now so widespread uh, in Iran is that the government is is not been able to censor uh, social media yeah. or control communications the way uh, the Chinese have. And well, Minchin again can explain yeah. how well that's really working now in China. We'll come back to social media, but Minchin, let's uh, let's talk about uh, President Xi because in your recent New York Times op-ed, you write that the failure of the zero COVID policy and the accompanying protests, that this is a pivotal time for the president, but that he can actually pivot to some of his predecessor's policies to make dramatic changes. How, how likely is it that, that President Xi would do that? Okay, uh, thank you, Larry. Uh, well, uh, good to see you, Larry Diamond. Uh, <laughs> first, I want to sort of add a few things to the question you uh, asked, Larry, and then I respond to the question you have. Uh, I think another uh, to see whether there are connections. Uh, other than bad government, they now have three really bad leaders. They they appear, especially uh, she especially and. Putin, they appear to be very strong, powerful leaders, but these two people are quite incompetent leaders. Uh, and finally, uh, their incompetence is showing in the case of Xi, how he handled COVID in the case of Putin, the invasion of Ukraine. And another threat is that in the case of China at least, they know how poorly Russia is doing on the battlefield. They also know the protest in Iran. So they are aware. And finally, I would say that uh, one of the triggers of the protest in China uh, was they saw maskless uh, uh, audience, <laughs> uh, spectators of the World Cup games. And that is symbolic of how well the outside world is doing. And they've heard a lot of stories about the West having successfully uh, sort of weathered the COVID crisis, having found a way to live with COVID. So I think the success of the West and the decline of authoritarian regimes, the two go together in weakening uh, authoritarian regimes and also encouraging the people to resist. I now, hadn't thought to, of the World Cup being such a demonstration. Oh yes, that, so, so but, in the, but that's uh, a great point that you make because the Chinese government wouldn't wouldn't black that out to where people couldn't see. World oh, Cup. they did. Oh, did Believe they really? They, 
they only later after the protests happened, they only showed the action on the football field and they wouldn't show the audience. Because if they show the audience, they would be masked with people. Uh, so it's just so interesting. But uh, in response to your question, I think she is starting to pivot. And uh, after reopening, because he has completely botched the reopening of co uh, from the exit from COVID, he had absolutely no preparation. Yeah, but now and... he's, he's betting on an economic rebound to, <coughs> sorry, to repair his image, uh, to find a way out. Uh, this is tactical. And it's unlikely to work because certain foreign investors, most of them have been burned by Xi. And uh, Western countries, Western governments, democratic leaders, they don't trust him at all. Uh, and even China's private entrepreneurs will not, <laughs> sorry, I have this just bad cough, uh, wouldn't trust him because they've been burned as well. So it will be very difficult Repivot, even if he uh, wants to deliver some short-term uh, results. How did he the not anticipate way. that everybody being locked up, you know, for so long, and then once finally they're allowed to come out, that there would be all this pent-up energy that the government would have to deal with? Because you know, we've we've seen examples of protests where people have been long term under COVID restrictions. People have a need to get out into the street and to collectively act after they've been cut off from others. How did he not anticipate that? Well, uh, again, that uh, is something that uh, Larry and I, who have studied dictatorships for a long time, know that information, high quality information, is a very scarce commodity. Because, uh, because of censorship, because uh, authoritarian leaders uh, want to uh, show that they are doing a good job, they suppress bad news. So how much tension is building up in society? The top leaders likely don't know. And their underlings are too afraid to tell him. So that's why when you look at powerful leaderships uh, uh, powerful dictatorships, uh, when they fall, they fall very suddenly. And that's because of the accumulated tensions in these regimes. Is that realistic that the way sentiments have built in China, that the government could actually be vulnerable? Could, could she be ousted? Even as at the same time, of course, he recently consolidated his power within the party. Yeah, ousting a uh, dictator in a dictatorship is actually pretty difficult. Uh, when you look at really powerful dictatorships like <laughs> the communist regimes, uh, internal coups don't happen very often. The only instance was Khrushchev uh, when he was deposed by his uh, colleagues on the Central Committee. Uh, so it's pretty sort of low in internal coup is unlikely in the case of China. But I think what is likely happening it will be very similar to Iran, very similar to Russia, that is, you have a slow process of decay. Uh, and then there's something very sudden uh, that is likely to happen. So, but it will, it's not the big one, right? <laughs> uh, like the California, we're, we're waiting for the big one. Uh, but we all know that in the case, uh, to use this, so, seismic analogy, tensions are building inside the system. And Larry, let's let's talk about Russia, what's happening there, where they've had protests and the government has, has cracked down. We don't have a good sense of public sentiment through polls about uh, the invasion of, of Ukraine, but the sense seems to be that um, as, as the casualties have mounted, that there's growing dissatisfaction with Putin prosecuting the invasion. So what is the potential, Larry, that that Putin could see his powers eroded? Well, I think um, his powers are not going to be eroded. He's either going to fall <laughs> or remain an absolute ruler. That's my prediction. 
I don't see uh, anything in between. And I think it will depend on the outcome of the Ukraine war. Uh, he's bet enormously uh, on this war. I think the reason why he is now frantically mobilizing uh, at a almost unimaginable level, I mean, I've seen reports of him trying to call up several hundred thousand more uh, Russian conscripts uh, is not because he's become so ideologically committed to this battle uh, in terms of Russian nationalism, though actually I think he is and, and that that is often underestimated as a motive for him. But also I think he uh, acutely grasps the intimate connection between uh, a Russian victory uh, in Ukraine and his own political survival as president of Russia. And if he doesn't uh, survive as president of Russia, he may not survive, period, uh, in, in any sense. So um, I think he can uh, survive continued weak uh, economic performance. But if Russia were to really fail in Ukraine uh, and have to accept humiliating terms of uh, termination of the war, uh, even uh, involving not, not just failing to gain the, ter the additional territory that Russia sought when it invaded in February of last year, but possibly even losing some or all of the conquests it made in 2014 in the Donbass region in Crimea, uh, this would be quite devastating. And Larry, I think there is a unique element uh, to the Russian situation that may not quite prevail uh, in either Iran or, uh, uh, or China, although Minchin can, can tell us if there's a parallel in China. And that is uh, Putin actually has um, a potentially serious opposition from the uh, even more extremist, if you can imagine that such a thing exists, fanatical, uh, imperialistic, uh, Russian xenophobic right. Uh, people who think, well, if we can't prevail any other way, we should use a, a nuclear weapon against um, Ukraine. Uh, people who are outraged that uh, Putin didn't use more decisive force from the beginning. Uh, people who are um, even more virulently anti-Western and anti-democratic, really fascist. Putin's pretty nasty authoritarian guy, I wouldn't quite call him a fascist. And, um, so, so what, what, in what way, Larry, would that pressure manifest itself, though, with Putin in power? Because it seems he has the ability to strong arm those folks away at this point. So are you saying that if Putin were to be ousted, there's the chance that these it, it even more extreme people direction. come to power? Yes. Um, I think it is imaginable that it could come from either direction. I think it is imaginable. You could see something like what uh, Minchin talked about before of a, a palace coup uh, to remove him. It's really hard to know. There's no institutionalization. Even in the Soviet Union back then, they had a Politburo standing committee as China does. I mean, they had a kind of institutional structure. So if the leader falls, there is a succession there. Uh, in the Soviet Union before in China now. If the leader falls in Russia now, nobody knows what's, what succeeds. Uh, but he's facing potential opposition, both from Western leaning or at least less, less, less anti-Western, more pragmatic figures, and even more virulently anti-Western and xenophobic figures. And Minchin, is, is there anything comparable in China? I mean, Larry was saying this sort of particular to Russia, but are there harder liners, say, in, in China? Um, we see the protests coming you know, from the other side of, of President Xi, but it, are there those who you know, wish he was even more authoritarian? Oh, yes, we do. Uh, but I think um, we don't have 
first of all, such people in power. Uh, and secondly, the government uh, actually doesn't like that kind of voice because it will complicate the government's business. Uh, one thing Xi Jinping does not want to uh, uh, do is to be criticized by his own people for any reason. So that's why you don't have uh, the real fringe, even though they do exist uh, in China. You don't have the real fringe front and center or even uh, well represented uh, in social media. If if President Xi were to move toward his predecessor, Deng Xiaoping's approach and open things up more, would there be a risk? Is, is that one of the things that would uh, potentially scare him away from doing it, that it would further embolden his critics and loosen his hold on power? Uh, well, uh, I think there were practical difficulties for Xi to uh, do this, to say what he has just done on co uh, zero COVID. First is that, uh, as I said earlier, China's relationship with the West, as long as she is in power, is very difficult to repair. Uh, people simply just cannot trust this guy. They cannot do business with him. They don't want to get into a fight with him, but they, they are not going to say re-engage uh, with China as long as she is there. And second, she himself, his own ideology, he's, very, he's the most ideological uh, so leader China has had since Mao. And that would go against some of many of the things he, he holds dear. China's place in the world, his belief that one party system is superior, uh, his uh, really ideological hostility toward the West and his distrust of the private sector, his belief in control, because he would be effectively negating or reversing himself. How can he actually maintain his authority? So it'd be very hard for him. So that, but at the same time, the guy also has, and the party as a whole is opportunistic, has a pragmatic streak. So when they, now that they're in a very sort of difficult spot, uh, they want to do something to improve the situation so that they can stay on a bit longer. So you're thinking that as China suffers because of the lack of international confidence in Xi's leadership, and as that expresses it in the Chinese economy, that it's going to force him to do what he's not oriented toward doing um, and, and find ways of opening up and allowing more dissent. No, he's never going to allow more dissent. He's just, oh, okay. uh, because, you know, what we know about dissent in a dictatorship is that once you open a little bit, then the dike is going to burst. And so he's, uh, he, uh, I don't know what goes on in his mind, but in his mind, he he's somebody who wants to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to have this very tight control, uh, uh, a system that has very tight control, but as his, at the same time, he wants the system to do well. He wants China to uh, be more powerful than democracies. Uh, he wants to threaten other countries, but at the same time, he also wants other countries to do business with him. So he, uh, uh, it sometimes it's very illogical, but that actually happens with dictators all the time. Well, and, and you wrote about, Larry, I'm interested in your thoughts, the sort of compact that um, Professor Pei has written about with, with uh, you know, Chinese citizens feeling like they can handle um, a degree of authoritarianism as long as it comes with relative prosperity and stability, and and that they'll accept that as a trade-off. And is that is that similar as you see it at all to Iran and Russia? I don't think. Let's start with Iran. I don't think that the. Uh, 
Islamic Republic was ever a shining economic success, but with the oil money coming in uh, in the early years, uh, there was some uh, degree of modernization. It is, as you noted, a very um, uh, highly educated population. But what the regime has done has led to with its, you know, with its glory projects and its international and regional aggression projects uh, and its pursuit of nuclear weapons has led to such crushing uh, international sanctions and such a colossal waste of national re resources and potential entrepreneurial energy that the country is flat on its back. Uh, there's massive unemployment, rampant inflation, as I said, environmental destruction that has not been addressed. And people are just fed up. So um, I don't think there's anything the Ayatollahs could or, or would do now uh, that, uh, that can reverse this. And this is why I personally think that of the three countries we're, working, uh, we're talking about today, Iran is the one by far that is most ripe for revolution. I think 80% of the population is against the regime. And uh, I think that many people in the regime now are scared by what they've seen. Uh, you can see this in even elements of the Islamic Republic. Uh, uh, some leaders, some Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps figures beginning to hold back and question the regime, openly question Khamenei's leadership. Uh, and I think they're in trouble. It doesn't mean they're going to fall, but it actually means they could fall if we start seeing defections in the security forces. Well, I wonder how much of that, Larry, is with, with the killing of Masa Amini when she's in the custody of the morality police setting this all off. It began as an issue of women's rights and then yes. expanded to the whole push yep. for democracy and overturning the theocracy. And I wonder if if in that pivot and that what obviously is this pent up drive toward freedom, that's got to be the thing that's so scary for the clerics. There. This is often how uh, revolutions happen. Keep in mind that the Arab Spring was ignited uh, in December of 2010 when a Tunisian uh, fruit vendor uh, was slapped and insulted by a Tunisian policewoman who told him that he couldn't have his fruit stand there because it wasn't licensed. Uh, and uh, he lit himself on fire. So death by another means, a martyr by a, a slightly different way. And uh, that led to a popular uprising initially against all of the economic hardships and indignities of the Ben Ali regime. But in the end, what people really wanted was freedom and accountability. And so they're the underlying deeper rooted principles and aspirations that get invoked once the dam is burst and any kind of trigger uh, sparks uh, some kind of uprising. I think so that's very clearly where we're at now uh, in Iran. And the question is, you know, really maybe a little bit over the horizon, what is the potential for that in China? Well, and in Minchin, so what do you think if, because that would be such a momentous event if there's another revolution in Iran, what kind of effect would that potentially have on the Chinese public? Uh, well, I think for the uh, progressive, uh, pro-democracy people in China, that of course they will be uh, greatly uh, encouraged, but I do not think we're going to see a domino uh, effect from the Chinese uh, regime's perspective. The Iranians uh, have again screwed up because after Tiananmen, we know 1989, uh, the Chinese Communist Party learned one thing. If you want to deal with protest, you've got to come in with overwhelming force, uh, like the uh, uh, you have to sort of shock and awe. And the Iranians have clearly failed. They've allowed the protests to fester for a long time. The longer protests go on, the less reliable 
the security forces will be. Uh, so, so I think if Iranian regime were to fall tomorrow, China will step uh, step up its control, censorship, and security will be increased. But I think the biggest shock for China would be on the geopolitical front, because the Iranian regime is a close ally of China, and it would lose one big uh, uh, sort of a pawn on its side, which could be used against the US uh, in the Middle East. So that setback would be irreplaceable. And uh, let's let's talk about Russia again. Uh, Minchin, your your thoughts about the uh, effect of you know what's going on with Ukraine and how how that relates to Taiwan in China. I mean, is there um, is there an effect of of the difficulty that Russia has had with its with its uh, invasion of Ukraine? Does that send a message to China? Oh yes, I think Chinese leadership is watching the war very very carefully. Uh, uh, there are both good news to report and bad news to report. The good news is that they've learned that it is if they uh, move on Taiwan, uh, they are going to be uh, faced with a very difficult situation that the U.S. is very likely to come in even, even before that, and the, the U.S. will get its allies to come in. So China will have to contend with a much more powerful coalition than it originally expected. <coughs> the bad news is that China is also uh, looking at uh, where Russia uh, is not doing so well. So it will learn the, those lessons. So its military will be strengthened at a tactical level. And then it will also try to sort of uh, uh, fortify its economy so that it will not be hit as hard economically by Western sanctions. So uh, so what would the outcome be? I think China will uh, remain very dangerous. And if, if uh, uh, eventually, if you want to, if there's going to be a war with uh, Taiwan, uh, potentially dragging the US and it's analyzing, it could be a much more bloody war. I want to take some uh, viewer questions. Reminder that you can put them in the Q&A on our program tonight. Please include your first name and your location. Uh, it's nice to be able to offer that to the other viewers. So let me uh, get to uh, some of those questions. Um, Sid asks, with the Netanyahu regime in place, what's the likelihood of war with Iran over their nuclear program. Uh, Larry, do you want to answer that? Uh, you know, I, I've got to say, I'm very worried about this. Um, I don't really think Israel can act on its own. I think that's fairly well established. Um, they don't have the weaponry to go really deep into the very buried uh, sites. Uh, uh, that are in mountains like the Natanz uh, nuclear facility. And so they've been seeking certain kinds of weapons that they haven't gotten from the U.S. because of our concern about this. Um, I don't think Israel could act successfully, decisively enough for long enough uh, to do this. Uh, and I think the last thing that the Biden administration wants is yet uh, another war. I actually predict there will not be Israeli uh, or U.S. or Israeli-U.S. military action against uh, Iran, but I think it, it, the die is kind of cast. Iran is going to creep closer and closer to nuclear breakout, and I think it's a, an extremely dangerous situation. Randy asks, is there a meaningful democracy movement in China, Professor Pei? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say that there is a meaningful movement in the sense that you have organized the groups uh, who are agitating for political change. You have people who regularly meet or have publications. There's no such thing because uh, after Tiananmen, 
the Communist Party uh, took very uh, effective measures to prevent that from happening. But are there people who would like to see democracy come to China? There are a lot of people. Uh, the Chinese people today are much more educated. And especially after COVID, uh, the, so the mishandling of COVID by the Chinese government, they the, why would they settle for incompetent and autocratic government? They would rather have an incompetent democratic government. So I think that uh, uh, the legitimacy of autocracy in China today probably is at its lowest level since Tiananmen. Uh, so, the, uh, but uh, the difficulty is that even if people want democracy, when you have such a powerful, well-organized dictatorship, it's quite difficult to uh, push that dictatorship out of power, at least in the short term. Bob asks, and I'm, I'm going to expand on his question. It's an excellent one. He asks, uh, is the, the population, uh, a typical Chinese citizen, aware of the Russia-Ukraine war and the course of the war? And I'd expand that even more, Minxin, to just sort of what access to information about world events does a typical person in China have? Well, based on my knowledge, most Chinese people don't know uh, Russia's setback because the Chinese official media uh, practically par parrots what Putin says to the, uh, to the world or to the Russian people. So it's a one-sided story. So the things we hear about Russia's military debacles on the battlefield, most Chinese people wouldn't know. But those who can uh, use VPN to uh, get over the Chinese, uh, the Great Firewall of China, they, they know. Okay. And um, so it sounds like there's there's reporting in Chinese media, but everything is through the Chinese government's reframing oh, yes, of world because events. The Chinese, That's... Government, the Chinese government controls the reporting on the war very, very carefully. All right. And and uh, what about other uh, global events as well? I mean, is, is, we mentioned about the audience not shown at the World Cup games, or, or it is um, with the ability to use VPNs to get around some of these restrictions, because I know in Iran, for example, people have quite successfully found ways of getting around the government um, uh, blocking of sites. Is that happening in China very much, or has the Chinese government been more effective at blocking? Oh, the Chinese government, the, the Iranian regime compared with the Communist Party is complete amateur, uh, because the Chinese government, uh, of course, is much uh, more sophisticated, wealthy, technologically more advanced. Uh, what is happening in terms of information leakage in Iran simply is inconceivable uh, in China. Um, so we're talking about a very tiny percentage of the population uh, in China that actually know what is going on, uh, other than so the Russian-Ukrainian war, what is going on with uh, the midterm elections, for example, uh, and uh, many other sort of good thing, good developments for democracy. Max asks, uh, with Professor Diamond's analysis uh, of the threats to the Iranian regime, is it more likely they'll push for a, a foreign distraction, i.e. an external war? Um, well, they've certainly been waging low-intensity war through their support of Hezbollah in Lebanon and um, their mischief in Iraq and elsewhere, uh, and their general destabilization of the region for a long time. I think they'll be very cautious about pushing beyond that, because if they were to enter a war and lose, it, it, that, that would be the end of the regime. There's no question about it. The minute that um, the country uh, was uh, at war and losing, uh, I think you'd see massive defections from the security forces as well. And that would be the end of the regime. So I don't think they're totally stupid or suicidal, but it is, um, 
you know, this is a regime that is in a very, very advanced state of decay with a very stolid and unimaginative and, you know, ineffective, completely overmatched um, president now in charge, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, uh, and just uh, old guard um, apparatchiks, Islamic apparatchiks, like in the Soviet era. And um, they may survive the current period, but I think the challenge for us is uh, to help the Iranian people keep the heat on uh, through information flows, technology, tightening the sanctions on the regime, not just for their violations um, of their obligations uh, under um, our, our expectations for non-proliferation, but also because of the human rights violations. I think we have enormous opportunities here uh, to help the Iranian people ramp up the pressure. Uh, and we shouldn't be deterred by fear that they're going to strike back in some way. It would really be suicidal for them. I'm interested in both of your thoughts. And, and I know this is uh, very difficult to answer, but just uh, your, your, your sense over all the years that you've had looking at autocrats, how much you think they're driven by their own personal vanity and ego and desire for power versus a grandiose view that they are somehow saving their countries you know, in the sake of Putin's case that he is expanding you know the greatness of Russia and its influence in the world in the case of Xi that he is somehow you know, restoring and protecting Chinese values. And in the case of Iran, that uh, Islam itself is, is what is at stake and uh, a government that's built on Islamic laws and, and theocratic principles. I know that's tough to disentangle because each feeds into the other, including personal wealth. But um, Min Cheng, your, your thoughts about, you know, how much of this is driven by each of those elements. I think, well, so it's driven by both because one side reinforces the other. One side would legitimate and uh, inspire the other. You would, uh, when you look at so she, the person I know, uh, so, uh, whom I study the most, uh, he first of all sees himself as unique. He inherits this uh, regime, which his father's, generation created. And he saw himself as uniquely endowed to uh, reach the original objectives of uh, the Communist Party. And then at the same time, he saw China uh, as not being respected enough around the world. He thinks he can take China to, in, to an entirely different level. And that only he could do this. So, uh, as I said, it's very difficult to disentangle uh, one from the other. They, they're just two sides of the same coin. They feed each other. Yeah, Larry, yes. your thoughts on that? Well, <laughs> I have a thought that may perhaps surprise you a little bit, which is um, I think there is a, a certain commonality uh, in the three regimes on enough attention. And that is um, each leadership uh, is, is after regional or global power uh, and uh, is after expanding in a classic um, sense of geopolitical rivalry and, and the great game, their, their relative global standing power and certainly regional dominance. Russia wants to, under Putin, in effect, <laughs> The Soviet empire, uh, that's a lot of what the Ukraine conflict is about. I don't think it was ever about a, a fear that um, Ukraine was going to join NATO because it was an extremely distant prospect. The fear was that Ukraine was going to join the West and maybe ultimately the EU and be lost to mother Russia. Uh, and you look what he's done in, in Georgia and Central Asia and Moldova and so on, and certainly in Belarus, it's all about re-anchoring 
the former uh, other pieces of the Soviet Union uh, and tethering them back to Moscow. Uh, and then thereby, because Putin has been doing this in other ways in Africa and elsewhere, making Russia a, a great power again. Uh, and uh, Iran definitely, look, this is really uh, what the conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia is about, much more than Shia versus Sunni Islam. It's, um, it's a contest between two uh, great powers within the region for dominance in the region. And Iran wants and has long wanted to be the dominant power in the Gulf area, if not the Middle East. Uh, and uh, the Ayatollahs independent of their Islamic zealotry, I think have that as a geopolitical right. position. And then with China, I, I think China is certainly bent on domination of all of Asia uh, and conquest of Taiwan. Uh, and then uh, beyond that, uh, I think uh, Xi and his colleagues envision and write about that they would eventually become the dominant power in the world. And you know, these prospects wouldn't be quite so terrifying if these regimes were not so authoritarian and abusive of, of human rights and international law. But this is what we're up again. I keep saying, I don't want this session to end without my saying it again. We're in a 1930s moment here. I have a number of questions. I, I'd like us to take them as quickly as possible to get in as many as, as, as we can. Uh, Phil asks, what is the impact of China's shrinking population? Ningxing? Oh, it's a huge impact, right? Uh, because uh, whether China can surpass the U.S. as the world's largest economy, how well China can do economically, a lot of that has to do with population growth. And China's population is shrinking. Uh, I think in the next few years, every year, China will lose, the, the Chinese population will be smaller rather than bigger. Uh, uh, and that will mean China will have fewer uh, the workers. China will have an older, uh, uh, more older people to care for, and that drags down economic growth. So that is the biggest negative factor uh, in terms of China's economic prospects. Tom in DC asks, what can the US do to further democracy movements in the three countries? Uh, Larry, quick thought on that. Well, uh, uh, Larry, I think the most important thing we can do is on the information front to try and break down the information firewalls, the great firewall in China and elsewhere, and enable people to get reliable and independent information. In Iran, I think we should be getting these uh, Starlink uh, satellite uh, uplinks to the internet that have been so effective in Ukraine. We should be getting them into the Iranian population there. And there are a lot of um, new strategies and new technologies I think we could pursue uh, in part using satellite technology that would help people uh, burst the barriers to free information. Would, would that be perceived though as, as in a sense a declaration of war if the US went so far as to allow the beaming in of programming banned within say uh, Well, you know, um, <laughs> we did this uh, during the Cold War through Radio Free Europe, international yeah. broadcasting. Yeah. It wasn't a declaration of war. You could say it was a declaration of Cold War, but in the end freedom won as a result of our waging the Cold War. Yay yeah. for radio. I, I, yeah. I appreciate well, that. Uh, Minxing, your thoughts on what the U.S. Yeah, could do? I think uh, uh, there's not really much the U.S. can do directly because these regimes have uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, in censorship schemes, secret pleas to pr protect themselves, very difficult to operate inside China, for example. I think the best thing the U.S should do is to make its own democracy strong. Uh, the, uh, when the US democracy is strong, dictatorships are weak. So uh, that's the only thing I think the US can do uh, at home. The stronger we are, uh, the better governed we are, then the Chinese, the pro-democracy forces in China will be encouraged, will be very, very optimistic. 
And Larry, you've you've written so much on that very same theme about strengthening democracies that it's difficult if yeah. if the functioning democracies are not really best serving their population. So, um, you know, maybe your closing thought on 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 that going forward. Well, I was just going to say I've just published an article in Foreign Affairs with my Hoover colleagues Brett and Aaron Carter in which we noted that the Russian and Chinese propaganda machines, both internally for their own people and internationally for the world, delight in promoting all of the ills of American democracy as a way of waging ideological war against democracy uh, for their own people and also internationally. So I totally agree with what Minchin said. I think we will strike a big blow for freedom globally if we enhance it uh, at home. And I will also say that um, I, I think that as we enter 2023, it's a much more optimistic moment now. We've actually made some significant progress uh, in turning back the authoritarian tide in the United States. And um, I think it's the authoritarian regimes now not least the three that we're talking about, the three most powerful that are really on the defensive. Thank you so much. Uh, Minchin, your final comment, and do you, do you see it as optimistically as Larry does? Oh, yes. Uh, I think uh, what I'm most optimistic about is that at least the three authoritarian regimes uh, we are talking about uh, this evening uh, are all led by incompetent, uh, uh, many uh, uh, megalomania uh, uh, leaders, and uh, uh, they are uh, uh, adopting or they've adopted self-destructive policies. Uh, and we <laughs> all we need to do is to sit and watch uh, uh, because uh, uh, we're in we're not in a hundred meter sprint. We're in a marathon, and uh, we have the democracies have the same power uh, because democracies can often self correct. Authoritarian regimes, if they have one particular skill, they dig a hole and they keep digging. Do you think that might apply to North Korea as well, Minxin? Yeah, North Korea is a sort of a, uh, a uh, first of all, I don't know that much, but North Korea is a family dynasty. So that is quite different from China's one party regime, Russia's one, one man rule and Iran's theocracy. But North Korea, frankly, without Russian support, without Chinese support, it cannot last. Yeah, is, and Larry, you, you, I see you nodding your head to that sentence. Well, I just add very briefly, break the information uh, monopoly uh, in North Korea. It's the most isolated, the most isolated country in the world. Break that monopoly and you will bring down the regime, even I think with Chinese support. Larry and Min Ching, thank you both so much. Uh, we've all learned a lot. This just tremendously nuanced, full of all kinds of valuable information and things for us to consider. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank really you. appreciate it. Uh, next Wednesday, the, it's the challenges of the Middle East, including Iran's seeming alliance with yeah. Russia and the implications of the new Netanyahu coalition in Israel. Ambassador Dennis Ross and the Israeli policy maven Yadidia Stern join Warren Olney in conversation. That's next Wednesday, the 18th at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 o'clock Eastern. Please support these important discussions with with a tax-deductible contribution to either Jews United for Democracy and Justice or Community Advocates, Inc. Just search under either organization. Please visit its website and make your contribution. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you back here same time next Wednesday.